Commissioner, Your Excellencies, students, dear friends. My name is Tobin von Fans and I'm the Vice Chancellor of Lund University. And it is a great pleasure for me to welcome you to this year's Anna Lind Lecture. Under the leadership of Margarete Vestager, European Commissioner for Competition, the European Union is addressing difficult issues pertaining to a fair and free competition affecting the relationship between governments, companies and cit citizens. The reach and influence of transnational companies during the recent decades of globalization has been tremendous as the flow of capital, goods and services have been facilitated by, by global openness. There have been many gains that have contributed greatly to our societies. However, negative impacts on human rights and the environment are also well known. Following 15 to 20 years of almost untamed developments resulting in the emergence of giant tech industries and other enterprises, it is time to reflect on how human rights, democratic decision-making and rule of law are protected and developed in this new global reality. Margarete Vestager has taken the lead in this, on this, particularly to ensure a level playing field or the right to conduct business for everybody without unfair competition. There is now an agreement that businesses should respect human rights in their operations. And thanks to the efforts of the Commissioner, there is a growing awareness that business had to contribute to the common good. Lund University has recently celebrated its 350 years anniversary, during which reflections on past glories and achievements have been made. It is not an understatement to conclude that this took place at a time when the complex geopolitical situation is not very conductive towards human rights, democracy and rule of law. The Jubilee was therefore also a good time to look into the future and see how the university can continue to honor the advancement of academic freedom, freedom of expression, gender equality and other basic human rights. In this respect, I'm pleased, pleased to note that Lund University has committed itself to take on a number of actions in, in support of the UN Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals. Human right is a prioritized subject within Lund University. The Raoul Wallenberg Institute of Human Rights and Humanitarian Law is a key player within the university with its long-standing reputation in Sweden and abroad. Both Raoul Wallenberg and Anna Lind are role models who have demonstrated that one person can make a difference, thus inspiring young people to continue their work. Lund University is also pleased with the cooperation with important and active student associations, the Association of Foreign Affairs and the Anna Lind Memorial Foundation. Then the event today is framed by piano music performed by Marie Buchheuer. And I'm happy that we all, for the 14th time, have been able to join forces for this annual event in commemoration of Anna Lind and her legacy. Once again, a warm welcome to you, Commissioner, and to all of you. It is a great honor and pleasure for me, on behalf of the Raoul Wallenberg Institute,
to warmly welcome Commissioner Margrethe Vestager to deliver the Anna Lind lecture here this afternoon. Margrethe Vestager took up the position as EU Commissioner for Competition, as you have already heard, in 2014, and she has managed to turn it, what most people perceived as a rather technical post in the Commission, into a post that has laid the ground for the future global political agenda. She has used her position boldly to clarify that the political battles of the present and future should not only be fought between nations, but also between democracies and globalized corporations, which for too long have been, ha have been having their, the things their own way. Those battles can't be fought by individual countries because, as we all know, global companies simply will go elsewhere if one nation tries to impose two fears of rules. But if a market the size of the European Union starts to assert its collective interest, then the corporations might have to listen, take notice, and even act fairly and pay tax. All those elements are key to the future and to the further development of our democratic societies and the protection of the rule of law and human rights. Commissioner Vestager once stated, this is a quote, the market is not the society. And she continued to say, for a long time, we have been told that the market is not the society, full stop. But the market is there to serve us as citizens. If the market becomes everything, you have this feeling that you are being cheated all the time and that you are not in control. I think we have the power to change that, end of quote. And I think this quote encapsulates so well the key challenges of our times that she addresses in such a profound manner and that rightly brought her the honor to be placed at the top of the global thinkers list of the past decade, the past decade, it's not a yearly thing, the past decade by the journal Foreign Affairs. Margrethe Vestager has a professional background as economist. She started her career in the Danish Ministry of Finance. She was leader of the Danish Social Liberal Party and has held political posts as Minister of Education, Minister for Economic Affairs and Interior. I might have forgotten something. Her CV is very impressive and she has been part of the political arena in Denmark, and now you can add Europe, for more than 25 years. But what impresses me the most, if I'm allowed to be a bit personal here, is her courage. She has taken on global giants like Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Google, and others. And she has been called, this is a quote, the rich world's most powerful trust buster. Something to be proud about. Once again, Commissioner, a very warm wel welcome. And we are all excited to have you here. And we are looking forward to listening to your insights and perspectives. Please take the floor. Well, now I should not speak because I can only disappoint you. <laughs> no, it is, uh, I just need to be able to see you now that you can see me better. Thank you. 
It is indeed an honor. I remember that day when Anna Lind was attacked, when she was killed. And the effort of her memory is so impressive because that allows us not to remember that she was killed, but that she lived. And that she set an amazing example for all of us because she was a visionary, but she was also in everyday life because she came over as a caring, a politician that wanted a society for citizen, for humans. So it's a great honor to join you here at Lund University at the invitation of the Raoul Werenberg Institute. Let me take you back to 1962 long before the majority of you were even born. There was a young law graduate who arrived exactly here in Lund. The topic of her studies, civil procedures in Sweden, wasn't sort of a likely topic to change the world. I'm sorry if I insult anyone here. But the thing is that what Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Ginsburg saw here in Sweden, that inspired her. And on that inspiration, she served to change the life of millions of women in particular. Because it is told that it was the experiences here in Sweden that first made this brilliant and thoughtful woman only the second woman ever to serve in the US Supreme Court, to start thinking seriously about gender equality. When she got, got into Howard, she was invited to dinner by the dean of the law school, along with the eight other women in the class of 500. And he invited them to dinner in order to ask them, each and every one of them individually, how they could justify taking a spot from a qualified man. Here in Sweden, she found something different. She found that one in four of law students were women. And women were not only students, they were also judges. And more than 50 years later, she vividly remembers a, attending a class where the judge was eight months pregnant. What Judge Ginsburg found here in Sweden was a society where women could tell their own stories and not have their stories written for them from the day they were born by law school deans trying to fight off the threat to their power. And this, in the end, is what our values stand for. This is why we stand up for freedom, for fairness, for equality. Because of all the young people, men as well as women, women who never had the chance to escape the roles that their gender or ethnicity or poverty chained them to. And because that the joy and fulfillment of your life, well, that finally comes down to being able to make choices. Since 62, we have made progress. We have definitely come a very long way to make our societies both fairer and more equal. We really worked hard. And the thing is, sometimes we tend to forget that from the very destroyed, not only physically, but also spiritually destroyed Europe, we have built the best place to live in history ever, especially if you're a woman. 
that doesn't mean that everything is fine. And that doesn't mean that everyone is well off. But we should never, ever be timid or non-assertive about what we have achieved. Because the growth of freedom and equality, well, that owes to the dedication of generation after generation of Europeans who on a daily basis have pushed things in order to allow for choice, for freedom, for self-awareness. One more thing, though. Technology has also helped. It has helped us to make choices, to make choices in our own life path. The internet has allowed people who would otherwise be trapped in their homes because of age or poor health to turn a maybe lonely and sheltered existence into something that would still enjoy friendship and experience. And it can help people whose ambitions or interest or sexuality leave a feeling of being isolated, being able to join a community, being part of something else. And maybe to find the courage to step out of stereotypes and be who you really are. And obviously, the internet also helps new voices to be heard. Not just the voices of the powerful, but the contributions of people who might not have had anything to say if it weren't for the internet. Take the Me Too movement. It may have begun with an article in the New York Times, but it was the internet that made it impossible to silence. For once, at long overdue, it changed because all of a sudden the world believed the woman and not the harasser. And that is the beginning of change. And it shouldn't be underestimated what it means when you start to believe in the one who is in the weaker position instead of the one in power. And in so many other ways as well, the internet has allowed us to do things in a way we could never do it before. It allowed us to learn when we cannot afford books, to study online, even though we cannot afford the tuition to the world's greatest universities or wouldn't be allowed in including, of course, that we're now our own travel agents, our own newspapers, our own controllers of our own TV channels. It has given us, in short, much more control. But when you then look at our societies and our politics today, you don't see a confident world where people have more opportunities than ever you see something else. Instead, you see anxiety and fears sweeping away all certainties and traditional parties, and even threatening the very values that we built European nations and the European Union on. And maybe this is because the European voters have seen more clearly and quicker than some of our leaders that the very same changes that opens all of this opportunity, well, it contains also the seeds of a much darker future. A future not of freedom, but of constraint. Not of opportunities for everyone, but of powerful interests controlling even more of our lives. There's never been a time in our history when political debates have been as open and as free as they are now. In this age of social media, politics, well, that is not only something that we take part in during election times. Today, all of us can be part of the conversation all the time. After all, that's what democracy is supposed to be about. 
But the troublesome thing is that this ideal of open debate, where every voice counts as much as the next one, that doesn't reflect what happens in reality. When you bring out a picnic on a warm summer's day, it doesn't take long before the wasps are swimming around you. And in the same way, an environment that's open and unfiltered very quickly gets the attention of power. And we have all seen the harm that it can do when powerful interests take over those of debates. We have seen how lies that spread online can tip an election, or so doubts about how we can tackle climate change, or even cost lives when they support outright lies about vaccination so that children are left vulnerable to disease. And the really striking thing is that it's so difficult to see who's behind this sort of disinformation. Because what might at first glance look like a glass, grassroots organization, well, it can turn out to be nothing but the front of very powerful interests. And these days, there are signs of a gathering challenge to human rights not just from countries very far from our own borders, but also here within Europe. But it's important to take that threat for what it is. I don't think that this is simply a spontaneous uprising, a sudden loss of confidence by people in Europe in the very rights and the values that keeps us safe and free. One recent study, it kept human rights as the absolute second, only won over by the value of peace. So there's no sign that Europeans have given up the belief and the willingness to fulfill our promise of human rights. What's really happening seems to be that powerful interests hiding behind anonymity are driving campaigns to strip us as Europeans of your rights. As I see it, that includes interests outside of EU who see our strength, who see our community, who see our willingness to come together as a threat to their own power, and who understand quite rightly that the values that we share, the key to the fact that we are united in diversity. But that also includes those within the European Union who see their power challenged by the rights of others, by the equality that means they have to compete fair and square, and the rule of law that gives people the opportunity to stand up for their own right. And sometimes, the digital world can undermine fairness and entrench power, maybe even without real intent. A famous study by Nature almost 15 years ago, it showed that if you compare the Encyclopedia Britannica with Wikipedia, well, Wikipedia is almost as good a source for information. That also shows that the internet doesn't only offer freedom, it can also help us better understand the world around us by learning from the wisdom of crowds when we come together and share our knowledge. And that can be a very good way to capture conventional wisdom. But the thing is that conventional wisdom is also filled with the assumption of power. If you take the Danish version of Wikipedia as one example, 
you would find articles about nearly 60,000 60, men and only 12,000 women. That clearly has to change. And so, a few days ago, to work on International Women's Day, with the support of Wikipedia itself, about 100 people came together in Copenhagen in order to start to change that fact, to write the biographies that we're still missing. And that is quite easy on Wikipedia. Everyone can edit. But there are times where it's not so easy to see what is correct. It can be difficult to see what are the biases that shape the world around us. And that is exactly what is the matter with artificial intelligence. It can help us, yes, of course, we see that already, to make better decisions, faster decisions, more informed decisions, by finding a pattern in data that we may not have the time as humans to see ourselves or that we may overlook. But the problem is, of course, that the results are only as reliable as the data that goes into it. And as much as we may believe in fairness and equality, the world we live in and the data that describes it, it's marked by power. One, uh, one study has shown that artificial uh, intelligence designed to understand the language can learn the biases in the way our world works. Learning, for instance, to associate women with the home and men with math and engineering. That is not the logic, logical outcome. That is just the biased outcome depending on the data who feeds the artificial intelligence. And that is exactly the problem, because we're taught to think that the computer is reliable, because it's logical. It cannot be tampered with, because it is not emotional. Well, I think that would be even worse, <laughs> to have the emotional uh, algorithm. But that being said, it's not any better than our prejudice is not any better than what we feed it with. And the fact is that the openness and the freedom of the digital world, well, it can be an invitation for those in power actually just to increase it at the expense of the rest of us. More than a century ago, Prussia and uh, Austria-Hungary they signed a treaty about taxation. They decided that they would only tax businesses that had a physical presence, a fixed place of business in that country. That was very elegant, because in those days, it seemed obvious that you can only do business if you have a physical presence. Well, what was obvious back then not so obvious these days. Because now it is obvious that you can do quite a lot of business with data that flows from one country to another without ever really setting foot in that country. You can make a lot of money without having any thought of physical presence, let alone a taxable presence. So, companies that serve million, millions of Europeans, who interact with Europeans, who create value in that interaction, they pay very little, if any taxes at all. And as every business becomes increasingly digital, well, if we continue this path, it will be a disaster. Because state coffers, they would empty, and they need the resources that indeed also allows these businesses to do their businesses. Resources for education, for health, for infrastructure, for all the things that make our societies work. It is only fair 
that every business, digital or traditional, pays their fair share of taxes when creating value doing business in the European Union. Of course, the best thing is to have a global solution. And this is why we, of course, support all the work done within the OECD. The timetable is that the OECD is to table uh, proposals and results of their considerations for the G7 uh, the G in the G20 ministers uh, in June. But it would be even better if we could agree in Europe that we together would make the push forward to update our understanding of corporate taxation to understand what a digital world is. It is everything. It is every part of our world. It's a very long time ago that the oldest trade on earth were having a digital side. And now also farming. Everything has a data side to it. So, maybe it's about time that we have a second look at the rules that governs what we want to make of ourselves so that we can strike a right balance between the needs of different parts of our society. In a few days, I do hope that the European Parliament will vote for an update of our European copyright laws. I don't know how many of you who goes to YouTube for the advertising. My guess would be quite few. My guess would be that you go there for all the songs and the films and the satire and the tutorials, you know, to update your makeup routine when you're past 50. <laughs> A lot of very useful stuff there. But it would be even better if the journalist and the singer and the writer and the film instructor got remunerated for the work they do that make us come there. And not just the remunerating the advertiser and those who sell the advertising. Well, here, we're trying to find a balance to make sure that we don't tip the scale in favor of those who provide the platform. I don't have the answers to all the questions that we rightly ask ourselves when everything in our society digitalizes, not only the market, also our government, and of course, as you all know, in particular, our human relations. But I don't think, now I do think, that we have to figure out how to regulate it. Because this is not just about finding the least disruptive solution. This is about dealing with the human rights of Europeans. It's not something that we should take lightly. It is something that we should take as a very fundamental challenge. So digital businesses, they need, of course, to see that privacy is not just another hoop that they should get through in order to do more business that privacy is an essential for freedom, that we have something on our own. Because the most vital guarantees for freedom is the principle that we have a right to private life, that it's nobody's business, literally, in this case. And for this right to mean anything, we need to be able to choose who we invite into our private space, who we let into our home, and who to keep out. And also who gets to see our private information and what it can be used for. And here it's very useful to try to understand that, how it would work in a physical world. No matter how much you love your mother, you don't want her to see everything. I think business should understand this as a fundamental. It's vital that they realize that privacy is not just another box to tick. It's more than a problem that, has to, that, that will go away if they bury us under privacy policies. 
Anyone reading terms and conditions before you tick the box? Oh, there must be some PhD student here. <laughs> no? No, I'm just so, it's only I who are the crazy person. Because it feels like nothing but exercising rights. And that is, of course, what we want. We want to be able to exercise rights. And as the digital transformation of our world moves more and more of our lives into the control of certain companies, our democracies will also need to find ways to make sure that they can step in, protect people's interests. In ancient Athens, democracy meant that those people who were recognized as citizens, they could come together and participate in a single debate. And today, for the first time in modern age, the internet again makes it possible to do exactly that in a single virtual space that we all share. But that space is very different from the meeting space in Athens. That Asian space was a public space. Its equivalent in modern time is privately owned. And this shift from, private, from public to private is not necessarily a problem. Just because the social media is privately owned, that doesn't mean that anything goes. But in a very complex digital world, well, I think it is important that we understand enough about how this system works to be able to keep them under democratic control. It can be quite difficult, for instance, to know who is paying for ads on a social media network and how a company that runs it chooses which post to make visible and which to remove. Do you know why you see what you see? No. And if digital age means that we rely more and more on private businesses to carry out the most fundamental tasks in our society, then we'll need a completely new approach to transparency. We'll need to be able to trust that digital business, that they are open with us, about how their services work, so that we can do our job and make sure that people's rights are protected. And just to conclude, this freedom given by the internet, this is a true, truly great achievement of our times. It's non-precedented, it's unbelievable still. But the idea of a totally free and equal internet where power is irrelevant is nothing but a very dangerous myth. The truth is, of course, that power is an unavoidable part of human life. You can try to limit the harm that it can do to us as individuals by bringing it under democratic control. But you can't wish it away. Power is here. And if you pretend that it isn't here, well, then you leave yourself open to manipulation because you don't see it. You make power entrenching itself so deeply that you may never, ever be able to find back equality. And so the first thing that we need to do is to, to protect our freedom is to be honest with ourselves, not with anyone else. To understand that freedom without democratic control contains the, the seeds of its own destruction. And to preserve that digital world where we are free to make our own choices the first choice we need to make is never, ever to compromise on our digital 
human rights. Thank you. Thank you so much for commissioning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner, for that incredibly insightful and inspiring speech. Um, we would now like to open up the floor for some questions. And uh, I would just like to ask you to have them quite brief so we can get through as many as possible. For <laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, the gentleman in the front. Um, my name is Jonathan Power. I'm a journalist with the New York Times. I've long admired your work and wait for the day when the United States emulates what you've done here in Europe. My question is about Sweden. Here we are in Sweden, a country that has long been in the avant-garde in the fight for human rights. Now, one of your achievements in the European Union, of which you personally have had a lot to do with, is the insistence on bringing into being a law on the right to anonymity. Now, Sweden has always, as long as I've been knowing Sweden, which is now for uh, getting on for 25 years when I first uh, worked with Olaf Palme on his disarmament commission as his uh, editorial advisor, and had the chance to see Sweden close up, and I've stayed with that intimacy over the years, I realized that the kind of freedom that's based on this new European Union legislation does not exist here. If you want to find out anything about any person in Sweden, you find it with a click on the computer you find the most intimate details that you may not want other people to know. Your age, your income, your marital status, the value of your house, and so on and so on. Why is it that here in Sweden, the leader, one of the great leaders of human rights, the country is still putting out this information why is it not following and obeying the legislation of the European Union? Oh, that was a tricky one. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't think that your, the way you characterize uh, access to data in Sweden is, is particular to Sweden. I think we're still in the process on making uh, this space secure. Um, because it's very difficult, especially in countries where you have been first movers. So you have systems that work with other systems that work with other systems and where you didn't start thinking about privacy when designing it. So there's a lot of catching up to do. And I think in that catching up, we'll also hopefully see that you give citizen a way to exercise rights. I, I very much appreciate now I know I have digital citizen rights. I own my data. I can move my data. I can get my data uh, erased. But it's even better than having rights also to be able to exercise rights. And here we are still in very early days and still pushing it because sometimes it will take new systems to be made, but also for us to get new services. We both need a public response and a market response. I very much hope that the market will give us independent digital assistance that will remember my settings. Remember what level of privacy do I prefer because we have different preferences so that that could be reflected. But I think that any, any member state who reflects and see we have work to do would invite others to do the work with them so that we could have a secure space in Europe and not just each member state on its own.
but doesn't Sweden have an obligation to follow and implement EU legislation? Indeed, but that goes for every member state. Every member state without exception. And part of the Commission uh, work that, I that I'm working in is to say that when we legislate, we will do the follow-up to implement. Because it's very hard work to pass new legislation. Problem is that you have changed nothing when legislation is passed in Parliament and Council. It's just words on paper. Only when implemented can you make a change in the way that people live their lives. And that, of course, is also a very high priority in political work, but a priority that's very often being a very low priority instead of a top priority, as it should be. Thank you. Another question from the floor? Yeah, at the back. Um, perfect. I first want to thank you for a very interesting speech. But secondly, Article 13 of the Copyright Directive is quite controversial, and I would be very interested to hear your thoughts on the movement against it. Well, it has been, this is about the copyright changes that I just spoke about. And uh, what I think is, is known all over Europe. Uh, I just had a colleague who was in a high school in Denmark who said that the students there, they were asking exactly the same question about Article 13, but they were a little reluctant in knowing how many people that the Danes were to elect to the European Parliament. So it's very, very much top of mind. There's been a very intense discussion between Council, Commission and Parliament about how to make sure that you don't sort of uh, get filtered out uh, things like Wikipedia, that you make sure that people can upload tutorials, that you can do memes, all of that now being secured. And I think that the intensity of this debate has led us to a situation where we have maybe not the perfect solution that will last forever and ever, but a solution that's a very good first part of balancing the interest of those who produces the content that we want uh, on our digital channels and the ones who monetize that content by selling ads. Uh, it has been extremely intensive what I hear for people who have been directly involved in it. And that, of course, is or probably tells how much is at stake, in particular also how much money is at stake if they are to be uh, divided in a different way. Thank you. I believe we had another one in the middle here. Hello everyone. My name is Ghulam Moinuddin. I am an international student. My question about this that you, uh, that you, in your speech, you told about democracy, equality, everything works only when there is democracy. In country like Sweden, where the adult literacy rate is 99%, of course democracy works. But in country like Pakistan, where literacy rate, according to human report, is 58%, how will, how will democracy overwhelm this? Like uh, when these people are given the right to vote, they are mostly are illiterate. And uh, by giving vote to wrong persons, it can create catastrophe which is already happening in my country. So what are your suggestions to overcome this problem? Thank you. Well, here I'm, I'm entering into waters where my knowledge is, is quite low. Um, and of course, you have a very strong point. One of the good things that we have achieved over the last decades is, of course, that now more and more and more children are going to school, almost as many girls as boys. Uh, and that, of course, is a good thing. But hopefully, also, we can inspire one another ac across the globe to get our digital legislation in place, no matter where we are in other legislative fields. 
because the digital transformation, it travels faster than the spread of democracy. It travels faster than everything else. And if you do not make sure that you have a digital rights, well then, of course, there is a risk that it is uh, technology that shapes the future of our societies and not us as citizens taking decisions about who should represent us so that in our democracies, we shape the direction we would want to take. And that, of course, is the challenge. And that is not only a challenge for, for countries with a very young or very challenged democracy, that is indeed also a challenge in countries where you have very old, very well-funded, non-corrupt democracies, you have the same challenge. Who should set the direction for our society? Tech or our elected representatives with a indeed public mandate? Thank you. Let's see if we have any other questions from the middle, just there. And further, just to the left there, perfect. Thank you very much for an interesting lecture. And I was also very pleased to hear that you're an economist, from what I understood. Uh, that makes me hopeful that there's a future after tomorrow's exam. Um, <laughs> anywho, when you look at the market for, for social media, it appears, as with um, many, a lot of infrastructure, to be um, what, what is called um, a natural monopoly. Uh, so therefore, I, I want to ask you, do you think that there could ever be a situation where you have sort of a social media market uh, that has perfect competition, or will it always be uh, the big and powerful uh, taking over the market? Well, I don't think that there ex exists such a thing as perfect competition. That's for one. Uh, one, of course, for the, the reasons that, that we don't have perfect information. And second, because we, we always want to frame it. In the first industrial revolution, when we realized uh, we had rules on working hours uh, that children couldn't work. Uh, in the chemical revolution, we got rules on what substances could you be exposed for uh, so that you could minimize harmful effects from pesticides or uh, whatever. So we will not have perfect competition in the sense of, of just the market working. We will have set a framework as democracies so I don't think that we should thrive for a Fata Morgana of perfect competition. But the thing is that with network effects, it is likely that what we, start to, what we usually would think of as monopolies, that dominance sets in, in a much smaller, um, at a much uh, lower market share than what we would normally think about. And this is why we think a lot about the role of platform access to data, and how we should interpret the fact that many, many small companies, great companies, European ideas, European entrepreneurs, are being bought by giants. Because if we, if we want to be able to give other companies a fair chance to compete, then we need to understand these measures. What's the role of a platform? What's the responsibility of a platform? when you both regulate access, but you yourself compete with the people who gain access. How to access data? You cannot be, build artificial intelligence without data. And what kind of data should you get access to at what terms? And this is where I think that competition law will have to be pushed in the coming months and years. Thank you. Yes, please, the gentleman. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting lecture. My name is Mikhail Bogdan. I'm a retired law professor from this university. And I was impressed by what you said on the need to subject power to democratic control. Now, Brussels, as we call it, the union where you work, has a lot of power. And for many years it has been said that there is a democratic deficit. You're too far from the population of Europe. And it has been also said that um, since uh, the, the most important organs are kind of contained representatives of democratically elected governments, and so there is no problem. But that means that kind of um, the democratic mandate of the union presupposes democratic governments of the member states. And are you not a little worried now that there are so many 
uh, not so many so far, but a f quite a few member states where the uh, approach to democracy is uh, not, not quite uh, positive. Uh, that, is there no risk that this will kind of contaminate the union when they send the ministers to the different organs, for instance, from governments that are not inclined to, to uh, our democratic values? Is there no risk that the union itself becomes, becomes less democratic in its power? Thank you. But this is exactly why something is being done about it. Uh, because uh, the Polish government, uh, we have taken them to court in a number of instances because the way they change uh, their juridical system. Uh, same as go for Hungary. Uh, also very active engagement uh, with the Romanian government uh, because the, to the risk of rule of law. Rule of law that you have an independent court system in itself. It's such a good thing that you and I, we have the same chance in front of a judge to have our rights or to be judged to be wrong. But also as a fund foundation of all the other things that we do. If you invest in a country, if something happens, you can go to an independent court system. So not only sort of our rights as citizens, but also the way our economy works rests on this very fundamental, the rule of law. So this is why we push to do something about it in the member states where we find that decisions are, well, more than questionable. On the second level of, uh, of your, your question, one of the, for me, important things in democracy is transparency. And our European, the European part of our democracy is probably more transparent than in any member state. The access to documents, the access to knowledge about who is meeting who, what lobbyist would be in the building? Well, it would be a lobbyist who has a meeting that will be public, that this meeting takes place, and this lobbyist will be in the public lobby register. So not only the fact that the members of the European Parliament are holding a public mandate, and ministers in, in council represent their countries, but also sort of the undercurrent that makes the democracy work, that you as a citizen can get to know what is going on. My colleague, my very good Swedish colleague, Cecilia Malmström, she has made so many papers available about the trade negotiations that people were complaining about the number. So she had to do a guide for you as a citizen to find your way to the most important documents that when you wanted to shout at her to say that she was completely wrong. <laughs> That's a good thing. That is how democracy should work. And this is what we are thriving for. But it takes an effort, exactly for the reasons that you stated. Thank you. I believe we have room for one more question. I the take questions from women too, I can say. Exactly. So the lady, please. Well, thank you for the honor of being uh, the woman who asks the question. Uh, my name is uh, Ana Maria Dujak Sigisten. I am the uh, vice chair of the Center for European Studies at this, this, you know, this university and also a lecturer in this subject. So I'm very, very pleased to have you here. And actually, I have a more personal question. In other words, uh, where will you be in one year from now, or maybe even at the end of the summer holidays, since the uh, European Commission in the current uh, makeup is uh, about to thank for its mandate? Where, what what are your future plans, simply, since you've been so active and achieved so many things? I'm sure that many European citizens would like to know where the most popular and most well-known commissioner will be going here next. So, thank you. Well, thank you, first of all, for the compliment. But since I've been in politics for 25 years, I know a thing or two about popularity. <laughs> you know cut the promising articles and keep him for a rainy day. <laughs> or for grandchildren who said, Mom, Mom, Grandma, weren't you doing something back in the days before you became my grandma? Um, second, um, I never really plan. Because the thing for me is that planning, it worked a little bit like blinders. You know, the thing you put on horses so that they're not disturbed. But the thing is that you want to be disturbed. 
And maybe the next best, best thing you're going to do, it's out here. So you have to see it out of the corner of your eye in order to see, well, this is what I should do. And third nugget of wisdom, uh, you can have this on your... In Denmark, we have these little sort of licorice things, and we have conventional wisdom like the one I'm giving out right now, printed on the cardboard. Well, the last uh, nugget of wisdom would be that if the next job is going to be a good one, better be good at what you do right now and stay present. Because otherwise, when you lose presence, you also lose direction. I have asked my government to give me another mandate. They seem somewhat reluctant, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, but since they're not going to make up their minds before July or something, I tend to think that it's, it's better to hope for a slow yes than a quick no. <laughs> so that remains to be seen. Thank you so much. Thank you. Commissioner, Vice Chancellor, Director, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, fellow students. My name is Richard Kronenberg, and it is truly an honor and a privilege to be giving the closing address on such an intriguing lecture given by Commissioner Vestea. Setting the scene for the not too distant future, 
pinpointing the challenges for our democratic society was balancing the many opportunities that follow with the rapid development of technology is no easy task indeed. And I think I speak on behalf of the whole auditorium when I commend you for your inspiring insights and initiated remarks on the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. The theme of tonight's lecture reminds me of the British author Aldous Huxley's novel, A Brave New World, published in 1932. For the successful use of satire, the author portrays a future dystopian society in which, the human in which humanity finds its, uh, itself enslaved under the very technology that initially revolutionized and transformed their lives. In contrast to the totalitarian state harnessing its power through government surveillance, secret police and torture, as described in George Orwell's novel 1984, Huxley depicts a society, a brave new world, in which the government retains control by making its citizens so superficially fulfilled and content that they lose interest in their own personal freedom. Through the leisure of technological innovation, humanity loses touch with itself, sacrificing the fundamental freedoms and human rights for the pleasures of high-end entertainment and mindless consumption under a constant haze of biomedically uh, refined pharmaceuticals. Huxley's dystopian rendering of humanity's future raises many of the themes Commissioner Vestager addressed here tonight. The risk of using technology to control society, the threat of fake news and disinformation, the hope of freedom, but also the fa fear of losing it through the fu future constraints, the right to privacy, the shift from the public to the private, the ethical problems of a technological-driven state, whether it be through the state or a conglomerate of multinational companies. In contrast to the brave new world set out by Huxley, Commissioner Vestea, thankfully, paints a more positive picture. The Commissioner argues that technological innovations through, for instance, artificial intelligence and big data does not pose a threat to our society if we make the right decisions and form the future, future policies for tomorrow already today. Once more, I, on, on behalf of Raoul Wallenberg Institute, Lund University, and the Lind Memorial Fund and Lund University Association of Foreign Affairs, would like to extend the deepest gratitude and appreciation to the Commissioner for her inspiring and thought-provoking lecture. In closing, I would further like to, as a doctoral student and aspiring legal scholar, stress the need for a broadened scientific approach to support the future policies needed to address the challenges that the Commissioner identified herself. In a world where the rapid development within engineering, natural sciences and medicine reshapes and redefines our society, the need to incorporate the so-called soft sciences humanities, jurisprudence, social sciences, etc., is key to understanding this new world. One must recognize the very distinction between technological development and true scientific progress. In a technologically driven society where scientific progress is expressed as the same thing as innovation and the refinement of technology, not paying attention to, nor involving the soft sciences, society will inevitably lose touch with itself. A proper scientific approach to these changes needs a contemporary, interdisciplinary perspective, extending throughout all of the academic disciplines, in which we uh, reflect not only on the way we refine and use technology, but also who we are, how we are, and what the meaning of our being is in this new world. Only then can we make enlightened decisions and form the policies of the future for the future. By illuminating the dangers of 
blindly accepting scientific advancement in the name of progress and acknowledging that we are a society that originates from books and ideas, I'm confident that a more utopian, brave new world will rise on their horizon. Thank you for your attention.